Uh, I don't want to be alive. I want to be dead. But to be alive is a grand adventure. No, to die is a grand adventure, Peter Pan. Speaking of adventure, what are we doing tonight? We are going to see the Shazam movie. Tell me about the Shazam movie. What do you know about it? I'm excited about it. I don't... I'm not familiar with being excited. (laughs) (laughs) What do you know of the movie? Tell me a little bit about the plot, Um, the premise, actors... I don't know anything about it, so this this is a whole new experience for me. I know nothing except for maybe a brief trailer that I saw and maybe some pre-existing comic knowledge of the character Captain Marvel. Okay, so the basic premise is that a kid is, like, lost in the foster system, but then becomes a superhero when a wizard grants him powers of gods. And uh, becoming the superhero makes him grow up. So effectively, he says the word and becomes the grown-up Shazam, or Captain Marvel, as he was previously called. Okay, so essentially, kind of like in Power Rangers Turbo, Billy, or the replacement for Billy, the little kid. Justin. Justin. um, When he would morph, he would then become a grown-ass man. It's kind of like that, only with a face. And also, it happened first, because this comic book is almost as old as Superman. So that was probably taken with a little bit of inspiration for that. I would say, well, based on what I know about what happened with Power Rangers, that was inspired by the Sentai version of the White Ranger, which was probably inspired a lot by by Captain Marvel originally, Shazam or whatever. Now, Captain Marvel aka shazam was the original captain marvel and marvel comics came out with their own captain marvel which is a chick um the first part of that is correct but not the second part because marvel comics is captain marvel was not carol danvers first she's the second captain marvel and in comic book canon but the character who was the first captain marvel from marvel comics was called marvel he was a kree uh warrior and he imparted his powers to carol to the best of my knowledge now would you go as far as to say that the marvel captain marvel is a kind of a retort or like a big middle finger to DC who first gave forth the middle finger to Marvel by stealing their namesake. No, not at all. So, um, firstly, the Captain Marvel character was not a DC comics property when it was created. It was just acquired later. Um, and I don't think any, I, I, to the best of my knowledge, I'm not sure, but to the best of my knowledge, Marvel Comics wasn't even a thing when Captain Marvel got his name. So it, I don't think that it's got it. I, I don't think that the two characters have anything to do with one another so much as they are like aware, like initially were aware of one another. That's really all. But no, definitely. I, I don't think that they're really like it's an intentional jab, like the thing with Deadpool and Deathstroke and everything else. Now, would, would you say that? DC's willingness to change the name of Captain Marvel was done as a maybe as a way to distance himself from the Marvel brand or maybe as a hey you guys now have a Captain Marvel we don't want to confuse the two characters apart what do you think they would have changed the name to Shazam besides the fact that it's a way cooler name um well I think that the reason that they did it was basically Initially, because they didn't want a lawsuit, but also I feel like they're just letting them have what is technically rightfully theirs. You know, it, it it's not in DC's best interest to have a character called Captain Marvel either. So, like, whatever. <laughs> now, in the movie, the kid's going through a rough patch. He's in the foster system. He gets these magical powers. Who's the villain? So, to the best of my knowledge, the villain for the movie is Doctor Savannah. I don't think you've I don't think you've ever heard of Doctor Savannah, but he is he's kind of like a secondary, tertiary villain in DC Comics right now. But like he's one of the main villains of 
um, Captain Marvel or Shazam. Uh, conventionally, he's like not someone with superpowers or anything like that. He's mostly just a person who like messes with people genetically and a whole bunch of other stuff. Who's trying to like get these powers that that Billy has and and everything else. But uh, so you'd say he's got powers, kind of like Rogue from. Uh, X Men, where he can steal powers. No, not exactly. No, he, I mean he's using science to do this stuff and and like trying to find the roots of of Billy's powers, Billy's magical powers through science, etc. So like, uh, he doesn't have any powers at all conventionally, but to the best of my knowledge, in the movie, he's going to have powers. Okay, so do you know who plays the main bad guy? Because at at a glance. From what little bit of imagery you actually see of him in the trailer, he kind of looks like that guy from Prison Break. Which guy? Um, he plays Rory in. Oh, uh, Dominic Purcell. No, it's not Dominic Purcell. Firstly, um, secondly, the I can't remember what the guy's name is who actually plays Doctor Savannah, but he is also the guy who played Sinestro in the awful Green Lantern movie. So. He's he's done the DC villain thing before and a higher profile villain, but also I presume that movie was much worse than what we're going to see. <laughs> well, uh, to play a little devil's advocate, and I'll probably get a lot of shade for saying it. The Green Lantern movie, aside from that god awful CGI spandex, it wasn't all as terrible as people made it out to be. I think it caught a lot of crap for the, the bad CG, but like. Sinestro looked right. A lot of the Lantern characters looked right. Um, Ryan Reynolds was not the right pick for the actor for the to be Hal Jordan. But I think that overall, there was a lot of good that was in the movie that people just aren't willing to look at past the suit. So I agree with that. But I think that the Green Lantern movie is an, was an important step to what we have right now. But... Um... I, I just I, I think that if you take the movie out of context with the comics, then the movie was good. And if you take the comics out of context with the movie, then obviously those are good. But like you can't compare it to the source material without getting angry. There's just no way to. Well, much, much could be said for the Arrowverse, too, because a lot of that stuff is just really wrong. That's kind of true. Um, it's not as true as Smallville. The worst TV adaptation of a superhero story that I've ever seen is actually Birds of Prey. Um, that was really bad. Really, really, really bad. Like, but also, this is this this show was coming off the heels of of Smallville, and think like they saw Smallville's success and said, "Hey, this is a thing we can do." And then they did that, and then they were like, "I guess it's not really a thing we can do. We should probably be closer to comics." And then Smallville never learned anything from that. But the next time that they did an adaptation, which was Arrow, they did. Um, but they still took a lot. Uh, of creative liberties with that show in particular. And I think that they've they've done a lot of course correction to bring them closer to the comics with stuff like The Flash in particular and like the other DC shows that are going on right now. But yeah, they've, they've taken a lot of liberties in any TV adaptation. When I started, I didn't want anything to do with it because I knew it was far off base and I, I didn't want to watch it because it wasn't Superman and I wasn't really super invested in Clark Kent in every historic adaptation of Superman. Clark Kent is maybe 10 percent and Superman is the other 90 percent. So for me, I wanted to see a Superman story. And what I got was basically a soap opera that had different characteristics of that world. And when I heard about it, I completely avoided it. But after I saw a couple episodes when they started actually incorporating more of his powers, um, I picked it up. I binged the whole series and I think that it was good as a show. But like you said, if you look at it just for the comic end, you get upset. You look at it from just take it for what it is. And it was fine. I think I don't think that it would have been a miss for them to actually incorporate it as a canon thing if they had actually done it the right way instead of trying to make it something else. I mean, I don't think so either. And that's part of the reason I'm sure why they have their own, like they've had their own series of comic books of Smallville. So like it's, it's a thing. It's not like it doesn't exist, but um, 
just to like it's like you said you you can't come into that show as a fan of the comics and not see something wrong with it but it, it sure it was entertaining in and of itself um but do, do there's a lot of that, incongruity do you think that the reason why it stood off as something kind of off base for comic world was at the time I don't I don't even think the Marvel Cinematic Universe was, was really much of a thing yet. I think they had tested the waters a little bit with the Hulk movies and the Spider-Man movies, but they hadn't really built a universe. And I think that the people who wanted to bring that to TV wanted to do so in a manner that says, hey, we want to introduce some of these characters and we want to kind of do a Superman show. But we're afraid that if we make it a superhero comic show, we'll lose our fan base and people won't watch it. We might get kids to watch it maybe but we won't get our target audience for that that time slot do you think that's probably why they they didn't go all in on the the comic book origins and history i mean kind of i I feel like there's there's like a lot of precedent when you really think about their motivation but i'm not really sure what what they were actually aiming for but i do know that um if you look at previous TV adaptations like the Flash series from the 90s or uh, Lois and Clark uh, from the 90s. If you look at those, you see a lot of um, you see a lot of the main characters being correct, but you also see everything else just just completely wrong, basically. So the main character is fine, but the setting that they're in, the the characters that they're working with, etc., that that's all like off. Like the further from the main cast you get, the more askew everything is. I feel like um, a lot of what Smallville was trying to do was take the Superman mythos and appeal it to uh, like young teenagers to young adults and tease the concept of Superman the entire time and not ever have Superman on the show. I that, think that was to me as bad as watching Monty Python and the Holy Grail tease the grail, the whole movie. And at the end, spoiler alert, there's no grail. So for me watching the show, kind of having that idea that there's not going to be a Superman in it and that the ending was going to make me mad. And that's all anybody would ever say, because that's all I would let them watching the whole series, just hoping to see him put that suit on even for one full episode and beat up Lex Luthor was the whole reason why I think a lot of people watch the show to the end only to get basically a big middle finger that says and scene. (laughs) Basically, I I think I think that there are a lot of wrong ways to do it, and I think that Smallville did it a wrong way, and I also think that Gotham is currently doing it a wrong way in that you have... So, firstly, with Smallville, you had a show that was centered around a person who would eventually become Superman. You called it Smallville, so what that says to me is you should have stopped it before he became Superman. So that show should have ended before he got into situations which he was in when he was Superman, like meeting Lois Lane, like, etc. All the stuff that he did in Metropolis, everything else. But with something like Gotham, you have a show that is actually centered around a character that's not the hero. It's supposed to be centered around Jim Gordon. So, but what Gotham is doing in their last season right now is debuting the Joker, debuting Batman, debuting everyone that shouldn't even be a focus of this thing. This, this shouldn't be... Like, the focus is supposed to be Jim Gordon and his struggle before uh, Gotham, like, sees Batman, sees the Joker. And I understand that they want these conflicts to, like, be integral to the story that's supposed to be upcoming. But the show's going to end, so, like, who cares? Uh, firstly, and secondly, like, what what's the point of, of debuting these characters when they're not even supposed to be the focus of the show? You know, and, and I... The, I say that with full confidence in David Mazuz and his ability to portray portray Bruce and Batman and everybody else as the cast in that show is fantastic. But the whole way that it's that's run is just poor. Um, I think that's if I remember correctly, when I researched a little bit on Gotham, when they were kind of developing it, they didn't want to get anywhere near Bruce 
or Batman or any of that. They they just wanted to focus on Jim Gordon and go- the state of Gotham, where it was at the time, and how it got to be where it was. Um, and then at some point, they went so far astray, and I don't know if that was due to ratings or something, or they, they might have teased bringing in a couple of known characters, and it got so much fan attraction that they thought, oh, well, shit, now we have to bring all these people in and just make a story happen. Yes or no? Would you like to see kind of a redo of Gotham as what it should be? Either A, just following Jim Gordon all the way through the way it was intended. I mean, I'm not I'm not sure if I'd really like to see that because I think that a great deal of these things have already been covered in comics. And if I wanted to see that sort of a story, which is basically Jim Gordon pre-Batman, I would probably prefer to see it in a comic book because they won't screw it up. Now, the B on that is, would you like to see a redo of it where it was supposed to be what it is now from the get go, what they're trying to do with it now, only without all of all the mistakes that they've made up to now? But what they're trying to do, what they've tried to turn Gotham into is Batman Year Zero. It's already a thing. So I'm good. (laughs) like it's these all these stories that they're trying to tell and trying to adapt like already exist in comics which is good that means that they're trying to adapt comic book stories but they're just executing it so poorly and trying to stitch all these things together that are so important by themselves um that they're they're doing they're executing it very poorly really And, and and that's that's i mean that's why i haven't watched much of the current season and a lot of the previous one because like I can't it's it's too far off I think where it lost me was towards the end of season two when I saw where it was headed knowing that it was going to be more like what it is right now and it, I had no interest um, and at this point I've cemented the idea that I'm not going to go back and watch any of it because it's just not it's not entertaining to watch people struggle to make a story happen Like you, you look at it like a Smallville. It looks like they have a clear vision of what they want their show to be. And with Gotham, it's the opposite. They have all these stories they could pull from, but they don't seem to have a vision for what their show is. And I think that's the hardest part to watch is. is So that's fair. But I, I really think like a lot of people are quick to blame writers and quick to blame like showrunners and stuff like this. But I really think it should be taken into consideration what networks these shows are on so smallville was on the wb which is the cw now which is not is not a network it's a cable network basically well it's it's owned by warner brothers well yeah but it's i mean it's it's i'm pretty sure it's a cbs subsidiary etc so like um but the cw will give its showrunners more ability to run their show while whereas a place like fox for example, is a network and the network gets to say on what stays and what goes and what changes and what doesn't. So in a lot of the situations with Gotham, the network probably came to those people every single season and said, we need more Batman. We need more Batman. We need more Batman because that's what sells whatever they're trying to sell or whatever. So you think you would probably place the idea of of blame for why this the show is so awful is on the network itself trying to meddle in the affairs of what could have been a pretty decent show i mean my my experience with like the world has led me to believe that when you look at something that's wrong you need to look as far up the chain as possible and assume that the wrongness starts there and then disprove your way down the chain so like I don't I don't have any proof or disproof about whether or not the networks do what I just said. So I'm going to assume that it's that way until I have disproven it. So it's it's just always easier for me to just assume that everybody's stupid and and like none of this is malicious. It's like assume stupidity instead of maliciousness unless you have proof that it's malicious. Well, it, w- it would make sense to me looking at what's happened to Gotham since it's pilot episode which is amazing by the way mm-hmm. the pilot episode made me want to watch it oh, absolutely. and right straight through season one so it, it looks to me like the creators and showrunners of gotham filmed the pilot the network said oh this is great we want to see that once it aired and was successful and then they said 
hey, do this instead. We we saw that Batman's awesome, so put Batman in it. And then they screwed it up because I'm pretty sure that Bruce showed up in season two. No, I mean, the first episode was was Bruce Wayne's parents getting killed. Well, I no, I know that. But what I'm saying is when they actually started involving him more regularly mm-hmm. was really starting season two. I mean, probably I'm not exactly I can't remember exactly what the story was, but I, I do know that in my opinion, were were it my job to run the show. I wouldn't have had Bruce Wayne be there more than like maybe four times in a season total after season one, because the whole excursion with his parents dying bonded him to Jim Gordon and everything else. And that's that's what you need to cover there. But you also need to cover like where the hell is Bruce? What happened to Bruce? That's the kind of energy that it needs. Not this is what's happening with Bruce. (laughs) Right. Yeah. Just give it a little bit of mystique and mystery, because when you think about Batman, there's a lot of mystique and mystery. I mean, as you as a comic book reader, you're you see it. You you know what Bruce is. You know who Batman is. You know all of that. But you should be looking at that through the lens of the city of Gotham as what Jim Gordon does, because to Jim Gordon, Batman's an enigma. Yes, he gets really acquainted with him in his older age. But he's still there's a lot about Bruce and Batman that Jim Gordon just doesn't even understand. Oh, and absolutely. I think that that would be a more compelling story. I, yeah, I honestly think with a story like Gotham, I, I don't think necessarily that a show like this should go on for much longer than it has. But I, I don't think that we should have touched on anything Batman at all, apart from like minor references from secondary characters that might have some idea of what's going on. But Um, What you need to tell uh, as a story in this sort of situation is you need to look at Gotham from Jim Gordon's perspective and you need to see a dismal downward spiral with only like like moderate moments of small hopeful victories that that are actually like culminations of stories that are like, oh, it looks like maybe Jim can actually turn this around. Oh, no. Well, it turns out the Court of Owls has been here the whole time or some I don't know, some shit like that. Well, that's that's what has always been compelling about the comics is Jim's character is a realist. He sees what it is, but he's also a hopeful realist. He thinks that if given enough good people that they could turn that city around. Yeah. Batman in that city was a means to an end. It was, well, maybe Batman can get rid of the super bad so that maybe we can take care of the lesser evils and then maybe we can have our city back. That ending never comes. Well, no, but that's because they keep the stories too intertwined. Like they keep talking about what's happening with Bruce and they keep they keep him as this relatable character. And you need to from the perspective of a Jim Gordon uh, and the perspective that Gotham should be shot from, you need to make Batman this this mythical legend of a thing that comes in and solves all your problems. So like what I would have done, like I said, is make this dismal downward spiral of a story of like what was happening in Gotham all the way up until Batman showed up. And then at the very end you have Jim Gordon, like, I don't know how this things have gotten so out of control and so bad. I don't know how we could possibly turn this around. And then the very end of the series is Batman on a ledge. Like this is how we turn it around. And that's the whole thing. That's it. There, it cuts off right there. There's no more, Gotham. That's how the show ends. So, so basically, what you're saying is, end it like they ended Smallville. Yeah, this is the kind of thing that should be ended like like Smallville ended, be, and and like it, they should have been even more distant from Bruce. Like I said, I don't think that he should have shown up any more than like four times tops per season. Like you can still have people around like Alfred Pennyworth because he's still a very worthwhile character, and like uh, you know. It, it, when Bruce was actually training to be Batman, he wasn't with Alfred. So it's not like that would be like inaccurate to Canon or anything. So like you could still use all those characters. You can still use all these characters that are in, in the city, but like you don't have to be so heavy handed about the Batman because it's not, the show's not about Batman. See, that's, that's where, whereas with Smallville, the show was about Superman. So do it. Well, I mean, it was about Clark. Yeah. So either either you need to make it about Superman at some point or you need to stop it. I agree. I agree. Now, in Gotham, 
Alfred Pennyworth, total badass. Mm -hmm. In movies, Alfred had a lot of witty one-liners, which made him legend. Mm -hmm. But in this incarnation of Gotham, Alfred was like... Alfred could have been Batman. <laughs> that's that's how epic he seemed from what little bit of interaction I got to see of him before I stopped watching. I mean, I don't know if you know much about the history of Alfred Pennyworth, but he's he's a certified badass in his own right. He's always been that. So that's that's mostly just something that Gotham got right that a lot of the adaptations just haven't even touched on because Alfred was an SIS agent before he was uh you know, before he raised Bruce, basically. So, like, it, yeah, a lot of the comics have touched on that, but uh, none of the movies really have gone there. Well, the 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 actor in the movies, I, I don't remember his name, was, I mean, was great. Depends on which movies you're talking about. The Tim Burton movies, which oh, th- yeah. that actor carried through all of the sequels yeah. up until the the uh, Christopher Nolan verse. Yeah. But no, he was funny, but that's all he needed to be. I mean, they're doing a another prequel series called Pennyworth that's about Alfred when he was younger. That so, that would be neat to watch. Maybe, but I think that they're going to do the same heavy handed bullshit that they've done with Gotham and try to like shoehorn in Batman stuff when they don't really need to. Well, they'll probably shoehorn in the League <laughs> of Assassins or what? what is it actually called? It's either the League of Assassins or the League of Shadows, depends on like what iteration you're talking about, but they're probably going to do a whole lot of court of owls stuff and a whole lot of racial ghoul stuff because race has been alive for God only knows how long. And like they're, they're going to shoehorn in a bunch of Batman stuff that, that they don't need to. Well, it'd be neat to see how it develops now. Smallville. Do you, would you consider that a prequel to Lois and Clark Superman from the nineties or totally different? It's totally different. These uh, every every single show that you you see that or show or movie that you see in which there are a different set of actors, you have to treat as a different canon. And that includes even the original Richard Donner Superman movies versus Superman Returns. Like those are intended to be the same universe, but they're a different set of actors, but they're all wrong. Like it's it's, it's wrong. <laughs> you know, it, it, you can't you can't walk into a situation with a different set of people and assume that it's the same place. That's true. And not only that, but the way that they handled the return of Superman, the way that it shot the characters involved in it, every, but everything like you said is different, but also the way that it is made is different. It's not even in the same league as far as what they used to do with Superman. It's not, not even close. No, and I'm not sure if you're talking about like production quality or just the just the just the tone of the movie. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. Like the production quality, the tone, literally everything about it, including how it's written and how actors portray it. Yeah, it's it's a totally different property, even if they try to tell you that it's not. Yeah, And, and and sure, a lot of those actors were inspired by their previous counterparts, but that doesn't mean that they did the character like they would have. You know, and and I don't know. It, that's just a like a bad experience as far as that goes. But Smallville in particular, I think, should have been the story of Clark Kent when he was in Smallville and when he was learning to manage his powers and and everything else. And I, you don't need to focus on all these things that didn't have anything to do with that. And the only thing that you should focus on that has anything to do with a mainstream comic book canon is the Legion of Superheroes. Because that was when Clark was taken to the future to become Superboy to work with the Legion of Superheroes. And then when he was sent back, his memory was wiped. So that could have been a thing in Smallville. It could have been. But there's no earthly reason for any of the other stuff to have happened. Like, there's, why did Doomsday show up in Smallville? Why? That was very bad. It's just like it, the show went so far off the rails that it's like... It, I guess you, if you really want to kill it, that's what you do. <laughs> that's if you want to kill a thing, you get Doomsday. It was the wrong time frame. It was the wrong origin story. I mean, like the whole, the whole everything thing was, was bad. The whole thing was wrong. Uh, but that's the, see, there's a lot of really like shining examples of good stuff that that Smallville did, like their portrayal of Booster Gold. 
like Michael Rosenbaum's Lex Luthor was not a bad Lex Luthor by any stretch of the imagination. I, I really liked his Lex Luthor. I, I thought that for an origin of Lex Luthor, that was believable. From episode one all the way to the finale, you got to see that evolution of Well, not only that, him. but you, you, you saw a, like an earnest portrayal of a person who could be related to, and that's what Lex Luthor should be. Uh, but like Lex Luthor should be portrayed in a lot of lights as a person you can relate to, but also as a total fucking psychopath, because that's what he is. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And I think one of the more iconic scenes in Smallville is him as Lex Luthor in a white suit getting rained on by blood. And like that was, the imagery was beautiful, poetic even. And just to see what he would eventually become and how he would get there, that that kind of set the stage. I think that if you want to look to how you tell a story of a relatable villain becoming into his own and why he's doing what he's doing, that's how you do that. Yeah, that's true. Uh, like I said, I, I think Smallville did a lot of things right, but I think those things were character driven things. So like they, they got a lot of characters. I don't know if you saw uh, Michael Shanks's portrayal of Hawkman in that show i did it it was if i if i remember correctly it was decent so yeah it was decent that's 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 probably one of my favorite things from the show but that's because i like michael shanks because i like stargate but no i i remember watching the series and thinking that hey this is oliver queen and he's a total badass in the in that show yeah he he was pretty cool. You know, he wore a hood, he wore glasses, he was kind of modernized. And I know that now looking back at some of the comics, it was taken right out of some of the different comics. Yeah. But looking back on it from the lens of Arrow and like, wow, that was good. Like, that was terrible comparative if, if you compare it to something better like Stephen Amell. Well, that's true. I mean, you could you could say the same thing about the 90s version of The Flash versus the one that we have now, because you've seen you've seen John Wesley Shipp's Barry Allen in that version of The Flash now. So, like you, you've gotten to see a direct comparison. Now, now, given that and this, that brings up an interesting point. Would that Flash be considered the same universe as the Flash of this today? So the, if you're talking about the multiverse, then yes, but the, the Flash this flash series that's currently going on has explored the multiverse a lot and he's from a different universe in the multiverse. So you would say that that incarnation of the flash, which they've explored in this new series of the flash, they're tied together. Yes. Same argument as the Superman movies, or is it different because they actually use the same actor in the same costume? See, I would say scientifically that it's it could be the same a argument but it isn't yet because we don't have any evidence of it because it's just a small snippet right also um it, as an important note the uh the scenes in smallville at the kent farm that were shot on the uh the uh the crossover the else worlds crossover took place in the same Smallville Kent farm as the ones in Smallville. The way that it was shot, camera angles, production, all of that. I mean, apart from the theme song in the background as well. That too. All exactly the same as Smallville. Yeah, that's true. So what, what that says to me is that the Smallville of Smallville and the Smallville in uh, the Arrowverse is the same place, basically. So that, and, and that's across... The multiverse, which means that Smallville likely has a multiverse designation in the Arrowverse, just like uh, Earth One, Earth Two, or Three. There's likely a Smallville Earth. I'm not sure what it is, but I'm I'm fairly certain that it's not Earth One, Earth Two, Earth Three, or Earth Thirty Eight, because I know what those are. Well, those those have all been explored in in detail, um, and none of them cross over as far as characters or. Or even imagery or anything like that. Or Smallville, no. But I'd love to see it. I think a lot of people would too. They'd love to see Tom Welling actually suit up and be in an episode. E even if it's a totally different, older version of that same Superman, but crossing through into the Arrowverse to kind of cement that it's part of the same thing. There isn't any reason why they couldn't do that. And that's, if I was going to pick a Superman for Tom Welling to be, 
in this day and age, it would likely be the Superman from Kingdom Come. Basically, they've all got kids and they're all these teenagers with superpowers and the heroes have decided that no one can be heroes but them. All these kids are irresponsible with their powers and they're doing stupid shit. They're right, in fairness. So, like, this is an older, wiser, and yet more cranky Superman. Would this be closer to the black suit Superman that has been portrayed in um, some of the cartoon shows where no 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 no. black suit superman is wearing a black suit either because he's coming back from the dead or because of some other close to death kryptonian experience basically see see the one i think the one i'm talking about and i think you've seen it and i don't remember where it was from but he was black suit superman and he was basically in charge of all the police i don't know if it was in in the entire world but definitely in metropolis and he to him Any superheroes were outlawed. Anybody but himself, because he didn't believe that anybody could be trusted. And he was a much older Superman. He had you could see his gray hairs and everything. Um, Maybe I'm thinking of the Superman from uh, Batman Beyond, possibly. I think you are. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that would be kind of neat to see for Tom Welling. Something closer to that. Maybe. But well, this is what I'm talking about. So. That's that's the Superman from the cover of the Kingdom Come arc. That that's pretty awesome. Yeah. Uh, basically, there's a lot of this angst about. Well, he's probably seen a lot of his loved ones be murdered. Well, not just that, but j- just the world that they live in is worse. Based on the way that the the storyline unfolded in Smallville, I think that that's where that character would end up, and sooner than this Cal did. Oh, absolutely. So, like, that's that's kind of why I'd like to see Tom Welling in a role like that. If I'm going to see him play a Superman, it would make more sense to me for him to be the Kingdom Come type of Superman. At first, I didn't like the idea of anybody portraying Superman in this universe except for Tom Welling. So I didn't want to give the new guy a chance. But after seeing the crossover that just happened where he was in it, I actually got a chance to give him a shot. And I think that he did. He does a really good job. He doesn't quite look 100 percent like it's the same argument, only on the opposite foot as we have for um, Hugh Jackman for b- playing Wolverine. He's too tall. But in this argument, Superman's too small. Like, Superman's supposed to be a statuesque giant. Mm-hmm. It, that's just how he's always been portrayed. And I think that that's the best way to show him being a Superman, is to make him larger than life. And to show in the Arrowverse, now this guy looks like he has the appearance of what a Superman would be. He's just really small. And he's not larger than life, so it it, it takes a little bit more to believe it. But once you give him a chance, you start to not notice how small he is in comparison. That's true. I kind of had the same interpretation, especially when I saw Tyler Hoechlin standing alongside McCod Brooks, who plays Jimmy Olsen or James Olsen. And James is taller by a lot. I was like, well, that ain't right. And especially since James calls him the big guy and all this other stuff like that. What I get from the interpretation of what I've seen from the Superman that Tyler Hoechlin plays is that when he comes up on scenes, he's not on the ground. So you're always looking up. And that's a psychological thing. He's still the big guy if you have to look up. Kind of like how Tony Stark's always, you know. Yeah, hovering. If I was a shorter guy, but I was Kryptonian, that's what I would do. Just be like, I'm still bigger than you. (laughs) But, I mean, that's just my interpretation of it. I I, I haven't really seen any evidence of that, but that's what I would do. If you you have active knowledge that Superman could fly in from anywhere and just knock any of these bad guys out with a single like flick of his finger it it invalidates the reason or need for any other character so to the fact that they're using him sparingly for these shows is good but would you want to see a standalone superman show with just that guy i i don't think that it's necessary and that's no like discredit to tyler hoechlin as superman or anybody else in that whole vein of of characters but like, I don't think that it's necessary. I think that all this the Superman stories that need to be told in that whole universe, multiverse, are being told on Supergirl. And his absence is being excused properly. Like, for example, right now, the arc that's going on is with Lex Luthor. But Superman's off world on Argo City talking to Kara's mom because that's what's left of Krypton. Like, he went to see his people, you know. I thought I thought that part of the reason as well was because that Lois was pregnant and it would be better for her to be on Krypton where that baby can't kick his foot through her. Not exactly, but yes, 
I mean, she's safer there than she would be on Earth. I don't really know too much about Kryptonian physiology, but I'm pretty sure that's not how that would work until that baby's exposed to sunlight. I'm just, I'm, I like, I don't know exactly how long Supergirl's gonna go for, but I do hope that we get to see John Kent because that would be cute. That would be pretty cool. Now, knowing that Arrow is coming to an end after next season, it's been brought up that Batwoman might be a spinoff that could happen. Also, one that I definitely want to see after seeing what I saw in that crossover. So it's definitely going to happen. My interpretation is that they're going to give Batwoman the same time slot as Arrow has had just to give it a, like a leg up in the rating. But um, the story in Batwoman is actually going to take place before you see the interaction between her and the characters in the crossover. So it's it's like a prequel to that. But this is like a prologue. You know what I would like to see? Uh, that, but to see some of the tertiary characters that interacted with Ollie and, and even Barry um, during their early origin parts of their stories that were maybe not necessarily throwaway characters, but you know they were integral to the overall flashback scenes or anything like that. Have them play maybe a little bit of a role in the Batwoman origin shows. Like maybe she interacts with those characters. I mean, that's possible. I don't find it too terribly likely, but I do think that if they're going to cover one person, if they have to pick one person that has been an arrow that should be in that show, it's Huntress. It's um, uh, Helena Bernelli. Yeah. Because she's more intertwined with the Batman mythos than she is with the Arrow mythos by a long shot. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they have to or that they will. But that's really the only character that I would I would put there. I would also like to see them bring back the actor who played the first Raish before he was inevitably killed by Oliver Queen. I think that I'd like to see a little bit of interaction from him before that whole thing took place. Well, possibly, but a, a lot of the thing that you have to keep in mind, which you, you don't really know. I know zero about Batwoman so, besides that she has red hair and a badass costume. She's a superhero's cousin, which is a thing that people do, apparently. But um, she is Bruce's cousin. She didn't know that he was Batman when she became Batwoman, when she started to do the whole thing. And basically, her connection to him was like a tertiary thing. It was not primary. She became Batwoman and started doing all these things. And then she eventually met Batman and learned who he was and then was part of the team. Like it was a whole excursion before she was part of the team. So she's not like a Robin or like a Batgirl or anything like that. She's not that close in the family, but she's still part of it. So the, that's part of, I think, why they chose her to make a story about because she doesn't have to be that connected to Bruce and she doesn't have to have all these have, have all this knowledge and know all these people and and everything so it's just as feasible for her to be what she is without involving bruce wayne at all a and that's good but there are a lot of other characters that they intend to involve which i'm excited for well what's what's neat for me to see uh is kind of some of the parallels to like right now in the real world irl there's a big push on the women's movement like more women doing more things that men have traditionally done so like 10 years ago, we wouldn't necessarily have thought that, oh, let's make a female superhero TV show because it sells. We would we're doing it now because more women are empowered to do things like that. But with that, we're finding some outstanding talent that knows what they're doing is intertwined with like they actually have a, a common interest in the source material. And they're talented enough to bring these characters to life in such a way that A, it's believable, and B, it's good, you want to see it. Watching, and I don't remember her name, uh, but when she played Batwoman on the Arrowverse. Ruby Rose. She yeah. was amazing. Like, yeah. it, you you watched that and you said, I gotta see more. Like, where's more of this? It's It's like you find your new favorite food and you just can't get enough of it. And then you find out there's no more left anywhere it's limited time and the idea that that could come back that's really exciting to me and i think that the reason why they're looking at stuff like that now isn't just because she's a great talent because we could have had great talent before but they wouldn't have given her a chance but now with the whole women's movement i think they're looking more for diverse tv shows that say hey you know girls can do this too and they can do it sometimes even better i think that she makes a more convincing character than anybody that has been on arrowverse 
I, I, I just think that Ruby Rose is a fantastic actress, but I, I think that part of the reason why she portrays the character very well is because not only does she know the character, but I, I think that that's secondary to the fact that she has been looking for a character in media her whole life to portray like a person like she is like she wants she she's been looking for a role model in media her whole life and now she gets the chance to be that for other people and through playing Kate Kane the character which like that's she said that it's basically an honor for her to do that and it's exciting for her to be able to do that and I think that that shows in in her portrayal and I've seen her play other stuff in other things and she's never been bad the first time I ever saw her do anything was in Orange is the New Black as one of the new inmates. And I think that she fit in, but she stood out a little bit. And I think that the reason why she stood out was the fact that she, head and shoulders, was a better actor or actress than most of those other people that were there. And I would say that that's relatively true, except for uh, Kate Mulgrew, who played Red. Yeah, oh god she was great she's an amazing actress too but like no, no offense to anybody who's actually on that show because they're all amazing actresses and actually diana garcia is in doom patrol playing crazy jane now so that's a thing but uh yeah so there's there's a lot of potential there i think i, I i'm just looking forward to see where the Arrowverse goes when it's no longer arrow and what they would call it i i think that they should still call it the Arrowverse. i don't see any reason why they wouldn't well, to retroactively remove something because it no longer is part of it would be kind of stupid. But they call it that because it was at the time the only thing that was there for the same reason why the small verse universe is kind of a thing on its own. It, it's the only thing that there was. But if they do include it in the Arrowverse, would it still be considered the small verse universe or would it now be part of the Arrowverse? What, what do you think that they would do with that? I mean, Smallville hasn't really been its own universe per se, apart from like its own continent. Nudie. Like well, nobody's that's what I mean. really nobody's really called it its own universe per se, but it's I mean to, to say that the Smallville universe is included in the Arrowverse is just to say that it's part of the multiverse that the Arrowverse has explored. So like this this whole terminology is is lacking. Like there's no good words for what we're trying to say here. Firstly, and secondly, I don't see any reason why it should be called anything other than the Arrowverse even if Arrow is no longer a thing. What are some other maybe heroes or characters that either have been introduced in the Arrowverse or maybe that haven't that you think would make a good spinoff? Honestly, there's there's not a lot of, of stuff that they could do now based on what they've done. So I know that they're going to cover Lucas Fox is going to be in Batwoman. He's Batwing. He's the second Batwing in comics, but he's still Lu Lucius Fox's son. So that's the thing. That sounds kind of neat. I, I don't know anything about some of these. Um, I would probably rate them more like a C or D level character that I'm just. Oh, well, maybe. But they're that's... so far away from the Trinity. It's hard to count them when you think of characters for the universe. Usually. Yeah, but see, this the real the real thing that you need to think about here is that they're more recently created. Lucas Fox's Batwing is a more recent creation that was created around the same time that Batman died and came back to life because Darkseid blasted him with his beams and then he had to travel back forward through time to become a thing again and then Batman Incorporated was a thing and then Lucas Fox became Batwing so like that's a more recent thing um, not sure exactly where the history of Batman versus the history of the Arrowverse lies but I'm pretty sure like the Arrowverse stuff takes place pretty late in the history of Batman so that's that's how that's gonna go but if that's the case then that means you have the potential to see how many Robins? I don't know. You have the potential to see Batgirl. You're obviously going to see Batwoman, but you have the potential to see all the tertiary characters from Detective Comics. You have the potential of seeing the, the gang of Robins that eventually the leader of which became the Signal. Um, his name is Duke. He was like in a cartoon as a Robin much later in his life, and then he got adapted into that story in comics and became the character known as Signal. So like, it, there, there's a lot of potential that they could do with that stuff. And you think you think that they would be great ad adaptations either for the Arrowverse or for kind of like the same idea of what they're doing with uh, Titans, Wh which which of those two uh, style of, I guess, incarnations would you prefer to see some of these spin? -offs? I, I honestly so I have sentimentality toward the Arrowverse, but I honestly prefer the interpretation that the 
whole DC universe like spin has given stuff. I really prefer the way that Titans goes. I really prefer the way that Doom Patrol goes. Well, it kind of feels to me like uh, as its own standalone thing, completely and totally owned and operated by DC, A, it gives it a more authentic feel because they're actually using the yes, they're they're using creative liberties quite a bit in some of these ca- some of these characters and stories but they're doing it in such a manner that it pays true justice to the actual characters themselves um unlike how some of the other like Arrowverse properties have but then again most of the Arrowverse stuff has been completely liberal on everything that they've done um so no I'd say it's more authentic to the character so that's kind of true but like you haven't seen Black Lightning at all and I think that Black Lightning has been very true to all of the characters initially like the only one that I'd really say that wasn't portrayed fairly thus far in Black Lightning has been Helga Jace, but you don't know anything about any of those people. I I think that everybody in that show has been portrayed accurately as far as their characters go thus far. I think that that's a good example that the creative team of those shows and DC TV in general has learned how much liberties they can take. And they learned that from doing Arrow and The Flash and Supergirl and Legends and all these other things. This this is how they learned. They touched the Superman mythos with Supergirl. They touched the edges of the universe with Legends. And they went from something like a Smallville to something like a Flash with Arrow. They, they like figured out what their boundaries were. And that's why... Titans is good, why Doom Patrol is good, why Black Lightning is good as far as the character driven stuff too. Well, I like I like Titans because it's dark and gritty. And I don't know necessarily that it's just because it's dark and gritty and it, it's allowed to go places that you know regular television can't do to censors and and all of that stuff that you can't do on TV. It's like there's some adult themes. Oh, that's very true. In but Titans. I, I think I think that the majority of why Titans is so dark and gritty is because of the characters that are actually used in the show. Not to mention that if you pair up a comic from Titans or any of the characters in Titans with the Titans show, those comic books are they tend to be a little darker and a little grittier because I mean you look look at Dick Grayson, his entire life has been in the shadows, not just because he lives with Bruce Wayne, but like his parents were killed when he was a kid and he's had to live with that struggle his entire life and then live in Bruce's shadow his entire life until he left and even then he was an angsty little shit. But then you look at people like Raven, who literally is the daughter of like Trigon. Like, yeah, this giant god of darkness. <laughs> it's basically, yeah. Like that all these characters, they've just had so much darkness shadowing their entire existence that uh, a dark, sh- gritty show like Titans is the only way to portray it. And the fact that they're able to go places that you couldn't on the CW or any other channel on TV, I, I think that's the appropriate place for a show like that. I-, I do too. But but I also think that like that sort of a universe is also capable of lightheartedness and fun and and etc. And you see that in Doom Patrol and, and you see a lot of uh, you, you do see a lot of the depth and darkness as well because there's a lot of like angsty shit about all the characters in Doom Patrol but you see a lot more of the funny side because of the juxtaposition of all these things. Do you foresee them taking um, the Arrowverse and adapting it to that type of I don't want to say light but that mold that they're generating with their new network would you would you think that they would take those shows put them on that network and then make them basically have less limitations on what kinds of stories they can tell and how they're told um, based on no longer being on network television anymore I I wouldn't say so I'd say if they're going to do anything like that they're probably just going to let those shows run their natural course and then once they have done so they might cover those characters in that universe because they've already stepped on their own toes uh canonically because in one of the first episodes spoiler alert in one of the first episodes of titans Corey kills a guy by the name of constantine kovar who just so happened to be played by dolph lundgren in the arrowverse and is not dead by any stretch of the imagination so that's like one of the first episodes they already canonically stepped on their own toes so they're not the same universe that doesn't mean they're not part of the same multiverse which we've already covered now, do you think that if they were to say reboot, um, I don't want to say the Arrowverse, but reboot those characters and those shows, uh, like have a Flash show 
on their network. Do you think it'd be better than the Flash that's portrayed on network television now in the Arrowverse? Or do you think that it would be uh, maybe less than because maybe that Grant Gustin has done such a great job in the way that they've portrayed the Flash in that story that it would never be able to reach kind of the same status that it is right now? What, what do you think that it would look like? I, I don't think it would be less than by any stretch of the imagination. I think it would be different than I, that's that's really all I can say, because I know that that the Flash, for example, has been really good. But I honestly think if if the if the guys at DC Universe are going to do anything with any of that property, it's not going to be in the same orientation as they've done it on the Arrowverse. So like you have your shows that are focused on the Green Arrow, the Flash and Supergirl. You have Legends of Tomorrow, which is basically tertiary people doing time travel fun. Honestly, and I think that Legends exists because they had so many compelling characters that they wanted to do something with them. So they they made Legends out of their ass. Well, not only that, but I think that Legends has been a terrific vehicle for the character of Sarah Lance because she deserves her own deal. Well, that's what I mean. Yeah. Like those characters, that, they, that character they made specifically out of the ether for Arrow. And she became this thing that was larger than life and the captain of the Wave Rider and all this other fun that Sarah's had. And like she's she's the main reason that that show exists. But also they have all these characters. And when Arrow ends, they're going to have even more characters that are free to play with. And Legends might just be a thing for longer than everything else just because of that. Well, I think it's a cool little melting pot for these characters to interact with one another. I mean, you look at Wally West wasn't really like a big thing on Flash like he, he was a little bit but he was really temporary and then when he wound up on uh the Wave Rider I think that was that was awesome because he all these characters have gone through tremendous growth on the Wave Rider from Rory being this bumbling fool to having experienced a hundred lifetimes and becoming intelligent not yeah. only that but becoming a New York Times best-selling author <laughs> But, right. But I mean, the the idea behind the fact that this character is intelligent, chooses to still be an idiot, but is really smart. You just see so many different sides of these characters. And then Leonard Snart become basically becoming the ultimate hero. Yeah, but Leonard Snart was he became what he his potential was, because in, in the comics, ever he's very much like Lex Luthor in that if he didn't have a superhero to oppose, he would be one. Right. Like there's no reason for him not to be except for this one guy who does it way better and i mean he, he's a fantastic actor anyway mm, but just Miller. just the idea that he got a chance to be explored more than just this intelligent criminal that showed up and blasted people with a cold gun like you got to see an infinite level of depth to his actual character and i'm glad that they brought him back in um a multiverse fashion so you can still kind of see um different sides of other well, versions of that character partly what i'm talking about because they brought him back as citizen cold and that's who the hero of captain cold was the hero version and it's that same thing so all, like, all these characters have been worth their own spinoff but i i the l amount of stories that they have to tell is not there no the, the amount of stories that they have to tell are finite and i think that the only way that they can really fix that is by going backwards which is what they're doing with batwoman and that's that's why i think that that's okay and anything that they might cover with that stuff is probably going to be okay but i don't think I, I i think that largely the universe that they have created um or the multiverse that they have created with arrow and all its spinoff shows is is finite and i think it's it's nearing its end closer we're closer to the end of it than we are to the beginning at this point in some fashion it's kind of sad to think about but in another fashion it's exciting because that frees those character properties up for that new network that they've made seeing what they've done with titans with one season to see that i could get really excited about a, a cliffhanger on a property that i thought there was nothing left to give it's ex so exciting to see that this is what the potential for other stories could be mm -hmm. if told through that lens on that network seeing even if they took a wally west and did it a flash series on uh, that network based on a wally based on what i've seen in that in the universe that they've created for titans they could do the wally west series that happened most recently in dc rebirth where wally west was the other wally west that came back from being dead in the time stream and like all this they could do a whole bunch of fun stuff with that property because they have all the characters and stories at their disposal they don't have anything that's limiting them which is proven by the fact that they're using uh Vic, um cyborg in doom patrol and he's been in the friggin justice league movie very recently so like did they use the same actor 
No, no, not at all. And it's not, he doesn't even have the same backstory. It's, I mean, it's, it's still close enough to canon, but it's. Do you think that they'll move him over to Titans? No, I, well, I, not soon. They might, but uh, his time in Doom Patrol is necessary. But I, I don't really know what they're going to do with that series either because they've explored a lot of the universe that I didn't expect them to. Like, I've seen some fun stuff. I'll have to watch Doom Patrol. I know zero things about it, but from as high as you talk about it and knowing what I know about the Titans show, if it's kind of the same same style, but maybe d- told a different way, it's probably so something I would it's, watch. It's very much the same style, except basically assume that it takes place in a mental facility. Okay. Because you have your... They're, they're, the show is chock full of crazy people, and they're crazy for reasons. They have good reasons for being crazy, not the least of which is Crazy Jane, because she's... How many personalities? I don't know. 42 personalities, I think, in one body, and every one of them has a superpower. That's just Crazy Jane. That's just crazy enough. <laughs> no, it's far too crazy. But anyway, um, she's being portrayed by Diana Guerrero, who played Maritza in Orange is the New Black, so yeah, she's it's she's doing a really good job everybody in that show is doing a really good job it's exciting to see brendan fraser doing a thing again oh my god he hasn't done he's robot man ever. he's fantastic like the whole show is fantastic i mean I, I have no complaints thus far I, I, but the thing about doom patrol is it's such an obscure story that they can't fuck it up like they can they can tell it just as it needs to be and it's still new to people it's still like fresh and and the way that the, the like interpretation that they have of it isn't necessarily canonical but it's you can tell that it's paying tribute to its roots and that's that's really all that needs to happen for anybody to appreciate it i think and not just this i mean like any of those properties being able to say hey this may not be canon of this character but this pays homage to them and does enough justice to them that you can say that they did a good x character story you know it, it's something that a, a comic book person could appreciate and not get all up uptight about it like some people do about smallville or about gotham or even about about the Arrowverse because there's plenty about the Arrowverse that is wrong but the that's done in such a way that it respects the characters to the point where it's still about that character and not a made-up character that shares its name and I think that what they've learned is that the stories need to be character driven and when the story is not canonical but it's still character driven people have more respect for it than if it's not canonical and there's no reason for it so like if they're going to break canon they need to have a character driven reason for it basically I don't know it's it, uh, it but it's it's good to see that they've learned something really well I mean with with any with any adaptation you have to learn before you get it right. I mean, how many times did they make a Hulk movie before they got the actor right for crying out loud? I mean, two, and they still haven't made one with the right actor. I really would line up first in line to see a Hulk movie about any part of his story with the new actor. I, I If I was going to see a Hulk movie, I would want to see something that explores both Mark Ruffalo as the Hulk, but also um, Thunderbolt Ross as the Red Hulk. Oh, yeah. Um, I'd Planet even, Hulk. I'd even like to see... Maybe not Planet, Planet Hulk, because Planet Hulk would be a little much. But I would like to see Betty Ross as, as her Red Hulk, too. Like, I'd like to see the whole... The whole Hulk family, really, just... If you ask me, Thor Ragnarok was just as much a Hulk movie as it was a Thor movie. That's true. Because up until the point that you see the Hulk, which was half an hour at most... I don't even think it was that long. Maybe like 15 minutes. He's in the movie from start to finish at that point. So from that point till the end, it's a Hulk movie too. Kind of. Yeah. And I like I like to see a lot more of Hulk being Hulk and being funny, like when he's naked in the hot tub and in Thor having that banter back and forth with him like that to me, that was very comical. Like that was funny. That was some funny stuff. And it's stuff that you wouldn't normally think of when you think of the Hulk, because you usually think that he's just a mindless killing machine. But the fact that he can be an intelligent or somewhat intelligent, funny thing like that, that was that was fun for me. I think that was more fun than watching uh, Thor light up the sky with with this god of lightning power is not god of hammers <laughs> as they put it in the movie i mean that's fair but you really have to take the hulk for what he is and if you want to see the hulk be funny as far as i'm concerned like that's a good place for it but also like there are cartoons that do that 
So well, if that's just, what you want to see, then go. I understand those. that. But what I'm saying is I want to I, I just thought it was neat to see depth in the Marvel Cinematic Universe for the Hulk. And I don't mean like, oh, I want to see another origin story because I think that that's played out. We've seen enough of the origin of the Hulk. I want to see more stories where it features the Hulk so I get to see new levels of the Hulk that I haven't seen before, such as the funnier side of Hulk or the fact that Hulk is more like a jock in a locker room. You know, that that's a new level that I didn't know existed. And to have the opportunity to see other varying levels of what he could portray the Hulk to be, that's that's what I would like to see in a new Hulk movie. That's fair. I honestly think, and, and um, we've talked about this before, and I don't think you and I, but... Um, I, I think that if you really wanted to explore the Hulk story and do it relatively right, you need to come at it from the perspective of, of a different character in, in that whole Hulk family, like I was talking about. And I, I think that the best character to come at that from would be She-Hulk. So, like, you come at it through the lens of, of her coming into this whole universe and you get to see, oh my god, Bruce Banner's the Hulk, and then all this other crap that he has to go through. And it probably could take place sometime around after Bruce got back to Earth from being where he was. And, like, you see Jen go through this transformation of becoming She-Hulk and then all this stuff mess with Thunderbolt Ross trying to figure out how to get Banner in jail and all this other stuff and then they, they could evolve into a series of things but um regardless like that's that's probably not going to happen because Marvel doesn't really have super have the rights to all the Hulk stuff so I'm not sure exactly how much freedom they have with it but we have gotten significantly off the rails from what the initial question was <laughs> Well, that's fine, because, I mean, the, the purpose of our little talks is mostly we start with an idea and we explore related topics as well. So we don't really have a lot to cover on the idea that we're going to go see a movie, which happens to be Shazam for anyone who's just tuning in. But the fact that there's more to talk about than just the trailer that we know of of Shazam until we see it, you know, this kind of gets us warmed up for the main event. Mm hmm. No, that's fair. Um, well, the only reason that I mentioned that we're going off topic is because I don't know how long we've been recording. Probably been a while. It's, it's almost an hour and 20 minutes. Mm, that's too much. <laughs> well, good talks are good talks. And the fact that we have this plus more to discuss means that there's going to be more recordings that include this topic. And if you guys want to hear more, let us know, because that's how we can continue to entertain you and give you our perspective on said topics that interest you and not just our mindless rambling about different things that we believe in or feel about different topics that you may have been interested in enough to click on this video so let us know in the comment section what you think of our perspective or maybe share your own and if it's something that you agree with let us know if it's something you disagree with let us know as well because i don't know about you but i get upset when people have an inaccurate representation of the things that i care about so if i've irritated you make sure to let me know and if uh he's irritated you like he irritates me um let me know too so that i can point it out to him later Please let me know if I have irritated you so that I can revel in it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's all we got for right now. We're going to go watch that movie tonight, so we will likely record a follow-up that is more, of, more or less a reaction to what we saw, what we liked, what we didn't like, and how we felt about it. Hopefully that video or recording doesn't take an hour and 20 minutes to get through, but I think that if you guys like this, you'll probably like that too. So make sure to follow, like, subscribe, comment below, all that jazz, and we'll see you on the next recording. Bye. If you like my content, please consider giving it a like. If you want to see more, make sure you hit subscribe and click that bell notification so you don't miss out.